that was our launch year. Uh, barking in the new year, barking mad uh, in some corners. But welcome to uh, part 33 of Libraries in Recovery. Uh, this is um, our first Friday of the year, uh, session 33. We started last year. Uh, today we're going to uh, talk about uh, open middle mile fiber to the uh, fiber to the uh -huh. uh, join the meeting fiber to the to the library fiber to anchor institutions. Uh, the series are are produced by the Gigabit Libraries Network. That's us in partnership with the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, based in The Hague, representing, well, the libraries of the world. And uh, a great partner in this, uh, IFLA is hosting and recording from uh, Netherlands, their headquarters. And we have uh, sponsorship by the Internet Society, which we appreciate. Uh, the prior recordings, the prior 32 sessions, are uh, located on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net. And you'll see uh, the list of speakers and we've, we've had some really great people on and extraordinary presentations. And we're gonna have another one today. Uh, we have John Sallett and Jordan Arnold, uh, the authors of the paper uh, that they're gonna present, they have presented and we're gonna review it today uh, at the uh, Benton uh, Institute, uh, and uh, we have Joanne Hovis, uh, president of CTC Technology uh, and uh, Energy, and work on the paper as well. And Joanne has about as much experience in, in community infrastructure development as anyone I know. Um, the uh, the we did, a, we did a survey, as you all are aware, because you registered. So there was a question there, what, what kind of topics you'd be interested in? We're trying to do some planning here for the year ahead. We've got some interesting things already lined up. Uh, but I would say the majority of the response is related to connectivity, either a role in the community, partnerships with other anchor institutions or other just community partnerships to provide it, uh, how to deliver it, um, so that's on track. That's, that's been our principal focus, but not entirely. Uh, let me advance. Where's my advance button? Sorry about that. Not moving. There we go. Uh, these are some of the things we're looking at ahead, uh, starting right now with infrastructure and middle mile. Uh, we're going to focus on E-rate changes. Uh, next week, we have E-rate specialists, and we also have uh, Cuyahoga, the county library system up there, who's just raised money in a new bond issue. Uh, how have they done that? So next week, we're going to talk about resources, funding, uh, and so on. Uh, but as we've done, we're going to kind of, well, the context for these has been the, the pandemic. I mean, that's how we started. Uh, all the libraries were closed. And so we asked the question, okay, what, what is a library now that, is, that it's closed? And so uh, we've been tracking this uh, the, the entire time. And that's constituted a, uh, a de facto kind of record of, of week by week responses by libraries. Uh, this is now merely two months ago, merely two months ago. And those were the numbers, those were, that was the graph. I know most everybody has been following these and knows them. And a month ago, shot way up over 14 million the, the numbers are, are horrendous. And here we are today, uh, yesterday, uh, January the 7th, over 4,000 people succumbed to this virus. 
And the graph you can see is kind of jiggly there. That's uh, those dips are uh, Thanksgiving and then the uh, end of the year. Uh, but if you draw a line through that, you'll see this thing is climbing still. And we don't know where we're going to end up with it. The vaccine, great, great news. But, you know, it's going to take a while. A lot of people, you know, it's and how, how different will our behavior be even after we uh, vaccinated? A little bit, but we're still going to be kind of distant. It's going to be a, a challenge uh, for uh, how we move in space, how we design our uh, our environments, how we hang out. So it wouldn't we couldn't really talk about libraries in response without kind of doing the largest uh, factors of of the environment, uh, uh, what's happening, and so you know everybody's familiar with what's going on, I'm sure. Uh, so here's some assembly, you know, that's, that's great, American way, fine. But uh, is, is that free assembly? I, you know, I would say, let's say not free, uh, and even less so. Uh, just incredible to pick up a newspaper and see images like this. Uh, that door on the left, that's the door the President of the United States walks through to deliver the address to the nation's State of the Union. Uh, that's uh, really hard to take. And, and this, this guy's face on the, uh, on the right, you know, he just looks kind of befuddled that, that he's actually inside of the Capitol. Doesn't really know why, but there he is. So awful. Yet, free and fair elections. We've, we've managed to pull this off. Uh, never was considered a big accomplishment to have an, uh, an election. Winning it was a big, but just having it not. But this year it, it was and uh, historic. So the new year is off and we'll have a new administration and that will segue into what I think are our topic today. And that relates to uh, the, the policy opportunities ahead to do the things that the country needs doing. And one of the big things that we need to pay attention to is, is infrastructure, uh, really across the board. I mean, we've talked about telecommunications and connectivity and so forth, but uh, uh, all of our infrastructure basically has to be rethought, redesigned, uh, and, and re-engineered because it's just simply not sustainable. Uh, our roads, you know, all of these things consume way too much energy, produce way too much carbon dioxide and other, uh, other uh, gases. And this is, this is the slow rising crisis. We've talked about a series of crises uh, uh, this year, this past 12 months has just been a cascade of crises uh, with the thing happening in DC just a couple of days ago, only the latest version of, of crisis. Uh, and in the backdrop of all that is this rising uh, heating of the planet that is just not gonna work out well at all. It's already not working out well. We've touched on some of these massive uh, weather related events, climate driven weather events, fires, floods, hurricanes. Uh, massive windstorms to the Midwest. This is this is only going to increase and intensify. Uh, so maybe the upside of all these, what we might consider as lesser and even minor crises in the context of planetary warming, will help us, you know, kind of wake up and get busy on dealing with this. Uh, the, it's been used too often, existential crisis, but it's exactly that. So uh, part of that is the critical telecommunications infrastructure and access to that, of course. Uh, we look at telecommunications infrastructure as not just kind of a new infrastructure, you know, new roads or new electricity or something like that, but actually the, 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 uh, the, the infrastructure that will make all other infrastructure more efficient, more effective, more uh, well, smart in a word, like smart grids, smart roads, etc. So this kind of makes communications a, a sort of a meta infrastructure, you know, the ring that binds them all. 
and that's the way that new projects will will be done. They'll be uh, considered. Okay, how can we uh, install a new exactly. smart grid so the electrical and system the will not uh, uh, fail? We can anticipate it. We can save money uh, by doing that. So that is a story. It's it's a type of a way to deploy broadband, as it turns out. Uh, but it's also a way to manage just the electrical system itself, which is a necessary interdependent infrastructure that the communications won't run without. So there's there are vulnerabilities in doing these uh, uh, these smart infrastructures because there's the inter interdependencies, and it's also much more complex. And mostly these are done at the local level, and the the people making these decisions have been doing it for a long time related to you know, asphalt and concrete and telephone poles. But once you start talking about ICT, information communication technology, they go, well, we wait, hold on, hold on. We, we don't do that. That's, uh, that's Jill over in the, in the computer room. She handles all that stuff. Or So there's a huge gap in the decision-making needs at the local level related to communications infrastructure and the knowledge level that exists. And so it's closing because people have been demanding it. People that are living in places that are underserved are, are banging on the door saying, you know, we just can't function without broadband. And our town is dying. The kids are all leaving. Nobody's moving in. Companies won't come here. We don't have a future unless we have broadband. It's just that simple. And I think everybody now, everybody finally is, is kind of recognizing that and buying into it. All this to say, uh, it, the circumstances look good to set up uh, a new broadband infrastructure bill as part of a new infrastructure, larger infrastructure recovery stimulus activity, uh, maybe similar to what we saw uh, in 2009. And so what will that have in it? What kind of approach will we take? Uh, well, today we're gonna talk about one approach and that's related to uh, open middle mile open access middle mile. So uh, these are a couple of quotes from our speakers, uh, John, Jordan, and Joanne. Welcome, Joanne. And uh, so this, in our mind, is, is, the, is the smartest thing that a central government can do, not just in the US, but really anywhere. And welcome to our, our uh, participants from outside of the US. Uh, it's a way to divide the responsibility, we would say, between the government and the market. That it, it could, you could do it however you want, but it's, it seems at least that the government can supply connectivity to the public institutions, the, the libraries, the schools, uh, uh, the anchor institutions. And that in so doing, they create, uh, they extend the infrastructure from the the backbone out into, into the communities, into the markets, closer to, to where people live and work. And that by doing this, you actually have an opportunity as a, as a two for one. First, you're connecting these priority institutions that the governments, we would say, have an obligation to connect. You, governments have to in, uh, allow people access to government information, government public services. And if they don't have a connection, how do they, how do they get that? Well. You know, they can go to the library, at least that. Education, schools, you know, they're, they're, they're necessary for operating society. So the government can use the universal service type funds to deploy those kinds of things. And then make, if they're open, that is to say they're available for others to tie into and create last mile solutions, then it reduces the cost and risk for providing access to residences, homes, businesses. And that's kind of the model that we're going to hear about today. And so with that, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, and, and let John and Jordan uh, take on, and then we'll have Joanne uh, come in and respond to that. She worked on this paper, and, and uh, then we'll take the discussion from there. So uh, welcome, everyone, John, Jordan, Joanne. And, Thank you, uh, John. You're on. Thank you. Uh, uh, I should say Jonathan is back with us. He was, he was here. I think it was in the summer. Uh, yes. About a lot of this. It's great to have you back, John, and and welcome, you, Jordan, John. for the first time. Thank you. 
So thank you, Don. Thanks for the chance to be here. Thank you for continuing. We're number 33 and we're just starting the new year. I think the fact that you've carried this forward, this discussion forward, will not only in the future provide a record of how people dealt with the pandemic, but the set of policies that will teach us how to do better in the future. And of course, Jordan and I are very uh, grateful for Joanne Hovis being on today. She taught us what we know in the paper. If there's anything that's good in it, it's because she told us if there's anything that's bad, it's because we didn't listen well enough. Uh, before I go into the paper, I just want to talk about where we are in America for a second. It's been a tough week and it's been a we had a terrible day. But as we look to the future, we have an administration that's coming in that has identified key crises that have to be confronted and overcome. COVID, of course, racial equity, economic recovery, bringing a society together as the president elect has said to heal. Those sound like different things. COVID, equity, infrastructure, ec economic recovery, but what connects them and what connects them in both the metaphorical and physical sense is high performance broadband. Throughout all of those plans, the incoming Biden administration talks about the need for robust broadband. And that means that getting really good broadband to Americans in institutions like libraries and at home, in addition to, to mobile, getting that kind of what we call high performance broadband to people doesn't just solve one problem, it provides the basis to solve a number of critical crises. Which brings us to libraries. You all are focused every day on libraries. We're gonna talk about networks that do other things because that's the way communications networks operate. You don't use a, 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 a internet connection only to talk about one topic and a different network to talk about a second one. It is that flexibility that comes from being a general purpose communications technology that's so important here because we can imagine a fiber connection coming to a library maybe supported by the federal E-rate program, maybe through state or local funds. And then we can imagine that that same network is available for a private or municipal last mile provider to connect to so that the library connection helps serve the provision of broadband to residences. And that makes total sense. It's, it's very efficient, right? The library is an endpoint and it becomes part of the delivery method to reach into residential neighborhoods. And that network that runs to the library or the school or to a utility building in the middle of town, that's what we mean by middle mile. It's not the so-called last mile that reaches homes and it's not the big internet backbone that spans the globe. It's what's in the middle. It's important for the reasons Jordan's going to describe, but fundamentally, what we need to recall is that it allows deployment to homes that's cheaper and can be more robust than what Americans have at home today. If we have a connectivity problem during this broadcast, it's because I'm in a rural place where there's no fixed broadband and Jordan is in a different rural place where there's very limited broadband off a DSL network only. This is an experience that too many Americans have, not just in rural America, but very importantly in urban America as well. There are three times as many, roughly three times as many people without, without the ability to use robust broadband in urban and metro areas than in rural. So let me just talk about why I think this vision can come out of the circumstances where we have today. That is to say, as we say here, a changed future. We're not going back to 
2019 when it comes to broadband. What has happened in the last almost year is that America has been forced to use broadband. We've learned to use broadband. Some people are lucky enough to work from home on broadband, essential workers are not. We need to thank them for their work every day in maintaining how we proceed. But many students have learned, workers have learned. I went to the doctor for the first time on video in, in, in 2020. And all of this is gonna change as we go forward. Not just as a matter of technology, but as a matter of society. As Don says, right? When vaccination becomes widespread, people may still think that they want to work from home, they don't want to be in an office, they don't want to travel in the same ways. And so broadband usage will go up. Let me give you two examples. We talked to Nick Bloom, an economist at Stanford, in a report we put out in October, a, a Benton report that lays out a national broadband plan. I, it would be wonderful if people took a minute to look at it because the open access paper that Jordan and I wrote builds on and supports that national broadband agenda. And in it, we quote Nick Bloom, who basically said to us, think of it this way about work. Before COVID hit, about 5% of work was from home. As of spring of last year, and it may be just as high now, given the numbers and the terrible trends that Don showed a few minutes ago, 40% of work was from home. His prediction is that when, every, when everything comes back, it'll still be 20%, in other words, four times as big as it was before. And the same we can imagine is true with healthcare, with government services, with education, with job training, with everything that adds up to the simple fact that we are in a moment where we need to recognize that no one can participate in American society without the ability to use high performance broadband. It needs to come to their homes. So in our October Benton report, we lay out a broad agenda on that. What we wanna do now though, is just give you a brief overview and then explain how open access middle mile connects. What we need is a comprehensive national agenda. And this can be the moment, I'm an optimist about this, the possibility of a bipartisan solution because people from different parts of the country and different political parties realize that broadband is needed everywhere by everyone. It's needed so that we get digital equity, so that we overcome circumstances in which too few people in minority communities have the opportunity, the effective opportunity to afford to have the skills to use that broadband when it's available. We need to focus on deployment, of course. That's not just a rural issue, but it is an important one in rural America for obvious reasons. We need to think about libraries and other community anchor institutions, because as you know better than I, we used to talk about a building, but now we talk about a service and an increasingly online service that has to reach people where they are instead of expecting them to come where the building is. And finally, competition. This is something I like to talk about because it's my background in competition. But the fact of the matter is, there's too little competition for what we call fixed broadband, the kind like a cable connection to the home, not including mobile because it's not a functional economic substitute. But for this fixed broadband, there's relatively little competition. The FCC numbers, which overstate the presence of broadband provision, say, tell us there's something like 80% of American homes either have a monopoly, which means they have no choice, or a duopoly, which means they have only one. They can go back and forth, but they don't have the kind of choice that is available in more widespread competitive marketplaces. All of these issues need to be dealt with in order to get people the broadband they need. 
and we'll come back at the end, but I think it's critically clear that federal support for this broad-based agenda is necessary. Jordan? Thanks, John. So why are open access middle mile networks so important? The, the fundamental economic principle at hand is pretty simple. These kinds of networks provide savings that can spur last mile providers to build further and faster. One example John and I found comes from Illinois, where the Illinois Electric Cooperative, which was operating in a low population density part of the state, um, and they were serving some towns with populations in just the hundreds, they were able to connect to the Illinois Century Network, an open access middle mile network in Illinois. And that ability to connect made it financially feasible to, to deploy fiber to the home, even as its rival, the local incumbent provider, continued to operate slow internet service over traditional copper networks. States are demonstrating the importance of open access middle mile. Arizona and New Mexico have both identified the strategic importance of middle mile uh, to connect rural and tribal communities moving forward. Colorado, for instance, provides funding and technical assistance for uh, middle mile infrastructure projects. And John highlighted this, but to be clear, open access middle mile can help both where there's no broadband and in areas where competition is scarce. So let's see, uh, over the last year or two, John and I spoke to middle mile networks and last mile providers across the country. And we found these lessons for success either in the planning phase or in the operations phase. Um, these, these lessons help make networks successful and help um, last mile providers connect to them. So first, networks need to adopt sustainable middle mile strategies. They need to work with broadband providers towards realistic business strategies, and they need to build community support. Uh, I wanna break down what each of those lessons means and provide a few examples. So first, adopting sustainable middle mile strategies. Um, that requires networks to line up adequate financial resources in the planning phases. One way to demonstrate that is through matching requirements in grant programs. So both, both Colorado and Minnesota, for instance, require matches from applicants in their middle mile grant programs. States and communities can also identify existing infrastructure to pinpoint gaps in their networks and um, save money. So Project Thor, which is a, a 400 mile network in Colorado, cost 2.6 million to build, which was relatively inexpensive because it was created largely from existing, and, um, existing commercial and public fiber deployments, most of which was owned by the Colorado Department of Transportation. Networks also need to plan for sustainable success. These kinds of networks don't happen overnight. And many middle mile networks begin with an initial mission or purpose, and then over time expanded to address new needs. So the Illinois Century Network, for instance, that I mentioned earlier, it began as an education network. It primarily connected schools um, and libraries and other community anchor institutions, but a federal grant allowed the network to expand and build hundreds of miles of fiber into underserved portions of the state. Networks also need to mitigate foreseeable risk whenever possible. So we see the example of California um, constructed a network called Digital 395, um, which was slowed over environmental concerns. So in reviewing the experience of building the network, Digital 395 encouraged um, other potential projects to carefully develop comprehensive environmental plan in the early planning stages of the project. And finally, open access has to really mean open access. Those obligations for publicly funded networks should continue even if ownership of the network changes. This was the case in Maine with the three ring binder. It was purchased by a company called First Light in 2019. So even if another company purchases the network, those open op access obligations should continue. Now networks need to work with broadband providers towards realistic business strategies. One way to do that is reaching out to non-traditional providers, including rural electric cooperatives and new providers that might start from scratch. Earlier, John mentioned that we have a competition problem in the United States. Today, large companies provide the great bulk 
of broadband service. Um, and at the end of 2019, the top 16 providers accounted for 96% of home subscriptions. So 16 companies account for 96% of home subscriptions. But operators of middle mile networks observe that smaller and less traditional broadband providers can take advantage of their open facilities. Um, and some can even start from scratch. John and I got to talk to um, an IT professional down in Southwest Virginia in a city called Roanoke. They built an open access middle mile network. And um, this guy, his name's Ethan Gleiner, he was living on top of a mountain and was able to start his own ISP, connect to Roanoke's middle mile network and, and bring service to, to himself and his neighbors. Networks, of course, need to provide commercially reasonable terms and conditions. So um, there's a network called Connect Arlington in Arlington, Virginia, actually where John is based. And it offers a cautionary tale of what can happen when a proposed agreement shifts too much risk um, onto the broadband provider. So Arlington's network offered a temporary license, not a long-term commitment, which made it difficult or even impossible for broadband providers to contract with their own customers. And ultimately no broadband providers were willing to connect to that network. Finally, networks need to build community support. One way to do that is to demonstrate community demand. And a great example of this is NOANET. It's a statewide uh, network in Washington. They have a system in place for community surveys to, de to determine need in a given community. And the network will actually supply a community with a project manager to go over the results of the survey and then write a white paper that includes market analysis, survey results, all that to help local leaders make data-driven decisions. Networks are also successful when they manage to bring communities together over shared economic goals. And partnerships work best, as you can imagine, when all the partners are invested in bringing success to a region. Uh, John and I found an innovative example of this, um, again in Southwest Virginia. So in, in 2019, Virginia's legislation passed um, a bill that would enable the state's two largest electric utilities to build extra fiber to their substations as they modernize their grid. So they're modernizing their service grid. They're already building out fiber. Basically this law allows them to build extra fiber to be used as uh, middle mile. And so one of these utilities, Appalachian Power, partnered with a county, um, Grayson County, down in rural Virginia, where many people have no broadband access at all to create a middle mile network. And when we were talking to folks from Appalachian Power, they explained to us that the utility has a personal stake in seeing the region succeed economically. I think Don mentioned this before, you know, rural communities will struggle to attract new young people and new companies if they don't have internet access. And so if this, the economy of the service area is shrinking, then the utility will shrink too. Finally, um, networks should join state and local resources together whenever that's possible. Uh, Mid-Atlantic Broadband, that's a network down in Southside, Virginia, was able to negotiate a resource sharing agreement with the Virginia Department of Transportation. And through that agreement, Mid-Atlantic Broadband got rights of way for no cost. And VDOT, the Department of Transportation, got two strands of fiber at no cost wherever Mid-Atlantic Broadband built. And so not only did this agreement simplify the building process for Mid-Atlantic Broadband, but it also let VDOT deploy smart traffic technologies like road cameras and traffic sensors. And now 85% of Mid-Atlantic Broadband's uh, fiber is carried along underground along VDOT rights of way. So I'm gonna turn it back over to John and he can talk about um, federal support and what that might look like. Thank you, Jordan. So what we are imagining is a bill well, Congressman Clyburn put in an extensive bill in 2020 that passed the House as part of a larger infrastructure effort. That, I think, should be the starting point for consideration because it was comprehensive. It dealt with deployment in terms of the construction of networks to places, to homes that had no broadband. It included Ad advantages for open access networks. It provided significant funding for digital equity. And then in the appropriations bill that passed in December, the Congress enacted a new emergency broadband connectivity benef benefit, 
of the kind that Ben had earlier endorsed to help people be able to afford broadband connections to their homes. Uh, that legislation, the earlier legislation from Congressman Clyburn should be a starting point because it's comprehensive. Now, we think in that bill should be measures that encourage and fund open access middle mile networks. Encouragement can come, for example, if there's a new network that's gonna to go to people's homes in a rural or urban area, a, a preference can be given to those networks that are willing to be open in any selection process. And that's in fact what the Clyburn bill does. But in addition, they could be direct federal funding. And the thought on direct federal funding is that it works in partnership with other funds like private funds. The federal funding doesn't require the network to be built all the way to the home because it's middle mile, but it decreases the cost of build up. And of course, it can be, bring better connectivity to institutions like libraries. So we think that that is something that needs to be considered by Congress, hopefully on a bipartisan basis, and that in funding such projects, Congress should look at efforts that would adopt sustainable middle mile strategies. The example from Arlington County, Virginia is to the contrary. A, a strategy that works with broadband providers toward realistic business strategies and one that builds community support. We heard this over and over again. Secondly, it's time that we not pit the federal government against state or local or tribal efforts. What we really should do is take resources that are available at any level, including the number of states, Jordan mentioned some, that support Middle Mile, take all of those resources and try to get the best possible out of that combination of resources. And as I say, this should be embedded in a national effort to ensure that everyone in America can use high performance broadband. I think the need for broadband has been proven without question. And therefore, as part of a plan to fight COVID, to advance racial equality, to move the economy forward, to to address questions of infrastructure, Congress can act. All of you are involved in your communities and I'm sure many of you contact local and, and state and congressional officials. I encourage you to talk to them about what you see your communities needing because it's about fulfilling demand, demand that's gonna be much bigger on, for broadband in the future than it was in the past. Because I believe if you engage with officials and they understand what people need to learn, to work, to access healthcare, to use governmental services, to interact with their neighbors and to build stronger communities. If they understand, if, if you were to take the message to every official and say, what I said at the opening, it is now essential for every American to have high performance broadband if he or she is to participate effectively in American society. If everyone believed that, then I believe the right policies would follow. So we've tried to sketch out some of those policies. We hope you take a look at them. But if the understanding of the importance of broadband is there, then we think success in these efforts will come. And so we appreciate the chance to, Jordan and I, to have presented our paper to you. And we're looking forward to, to Joanne's comments. That's great, John and, and Jordan. Uh, terrific presentation of, of, of your uh, excellent paper, which has been linked not only on the, on the registration site, but is also in the chat. Uh, I, we strongly encourage people to uh, review this, become familiar with the, the premise of this approach. Uh, it, it has so many advantages. Um, let's, let's go to uh, Joanne now. Uh, 
Uh, I've got a load of questions. I'm sure others do too. One of the points made was that uh, uh, that that Shelby, the school's health and libraries broadband coalition, has uh, a, a paper on this and talk, <coughs> talks about to and through anchor institutions. So normally anchor institutions are thought of as kind of another type of an end user, which is absolutely true, but they, in this scenario, they can play the role of intermediate endpoints, if that makes any sense, uh, either being actual or proximate to interconnect points as these middle mile infrastructure uh, projects are deployed. And just by the nature of these institutions, they're scattered across communities. You know, you want the school and the close and the library to be as close as possible. Well, that will help you uh, reach the, the, those endpoints with last mile. So I'm gonna hold some questions because Joanne will probably answer most of them. And uh, we'll see what we get at the end. And Joanne, welcome. Uh, great to have you for the first time. And uh, please uh, tell us, you know, what, what we've missed here and what you think we should be doing. Um, thanks, Don. It's a real pleasure to be with you, uh, with all of you. And um, I uh, am honored to um, get to follow Jordan and John. I, I think their very thoughtful paper is important and incredibly timely given the issues we're debating in light of the pandemic and, and where we find ourselves and, and hopefully where we find ourselves is at the beginning of a significant new federal commitment to filling broadband gaps and creating new broadband opportunity and competition. And that this model, this open access middle mile model with libraries and other anchor institutions sitting right at the middle of the model will be a very important part of that new federal commitment. And I, I think in order to really succeed, that commitment will have to be federal, state, and local, working with the private sector. But the federal government certainly has a huge role on the, the funding and the policy side. Um, let me share a few thoughts with all of you, um, just reacting to what John and Jordan have shared and, and maybe you know, a few um, data points or uh, stories that highlight some of um, the model they're speaking about. Um, I um, was a very minor contributor to this paper. I, I gave a couple of anecdotes that illustrate the point they were making, and I'll share those with you in a moment. Um, but the paper, I think, um, lays out this broad framework for understanding the model, understanding best practices for deploying the model, and I think also very consequentially, understanding what the middle mile really is and what it isn't. And if I can take a minute to share that, there's a really useful graphic that you all have in the materials that Don sent you that is part of John and Jordan's paper, um, where you see how libraries fit into this big picture of middle mile networks. Um, as, as you know, when you think about the communications infrastructure and how it supports um, networking across the country, but really internationally, the, the broader framework to understand it is that there are four major components, um, three of which we're really con concerned with here. The first one is the long haul connections. And in, in a US context, those are the big bundles of cross-country fiber that go north-south and um, east-west across the country and that carry the bulk of the internet traffic. This is literally the backbone of the internet, connecting the major data centers uh, and carrier hotels in the major um, population centers of the country. Um, the equivalent of the interstate highway system in that old analogy of um, roads and, and that is an area where we are relatively well served as a nation, where we have very robust infrastructure of these massive bundles of fiber. Um, the international piece of this, of course, is the undersea cable that links us to other continents. But across the US, generally following railroad and other kinds of rights of way, we've got these huge bundles of fiber in the backbone. And then from there, we have the middle mile. And that is the critical piece that 
John and Jordan are speaking to and where the deficiencies are enormous compared to the relative lack of deficiency on the long haul or backbone side. The middle mile piece is the equivalent of state highways or state roads in the old roads analogy. And these are, this is the piece of the network that goes from the data centers or from the, the major interconnection locations and goes out into the communities, into the neighborhoods, into small towns, into neighborhoods of big urban environments or smaller urban environments. And that is really the connective tissue taking the backbone of the internet into our communities. And then we have the last mile. The last mile is that you know, storied and critically important, very costly and very challenging piece that takes us from the neighborhood location to our homes, our businesses, our institutions. And the final piece, the fourth one is what we'll call the drops or the final connection, actually going from the curb into our home, from the curb into our business, et cetera. But for purposes of today's conversation, it's really the middle mile as that connective tissue between backbone or long haul and last mile that is so critical. And that middle mile is an absolutely essential piece of getting the last mile built. If there is not middle mile, there will not be last mile. And if there's middle mile, but it can't be accessed, there can't be new last mile, right? If it is closed, if it is proprietary, if it is held by a single entity um, for monopoly rents or just not available to users, then last mile cannot grow off it in the same way as it's really hard to imagine um, developing neighborhood streets and roads and alleys if you don't have the big roads coming into the neighborhood because you'll have an island of development that is not connected to anything. Middle Mile makes sure that our neighborhoods are not islands isolated from the internet backbone. Middle Mile connects our neighborhoods to the internet backbone, hence its criticality. And the power of that middle mile in the economic model for last mile is enormous, as in some of the examples that Jordan shared. Like, I think very importantly, it, there is no single number that we can attach. We cannot say that if you build middle mile, it will be X percent of the cost of last mile because every network is different, every circumstance is different. Um, every project will have different costs associated with it, depending on geographic and other factors. But we do know that without middle mile, last mile becomes a much more costly proposition because the last mile deployer, um, which could be the library or another anchor institution or their partner sitting right there at the intersection between middle mile and last mile, that last mile deployer is um, going to be an island without the middle mile. So let me give you a few examples of illustrative numbers with that caveat that there's no absolute rule about what the savings could be or what the percentage of cost is on middle mile as compared to last mile. Every project will be different, but here's a, a sense of some of the power. An example that Jordan and John write about in the paper is the little town of Alford, Massachusetts. Alford has 350 residents. It had no broadband at all until about three years ago. The town built fiber to the premises, actually entered into a public-public partnership with a neighboring uh, public electric utility um, called uh, Whip City Electric uh, that had operates its own network and was willing to uh, uh, use that expertise and capacity to provide services over the town of Alford's network. But the town itself built and funded the last mile fiber to the premises infrastructure. The, that town would have had to make a 20 mile connection to the nearest commercial interconnection point had there not been a public middle mile network available to it. And our analysis of the cost to make that connection to um, that nearest interconnection point was that it would have been as much for the one middle mile connection to make sure that the town who is not building an island of isolated fiber as it costs to build fiber to the premises to 100% of the residents of the town. 
that's a really powerful example, I think, of the criticality of Middle Mile and the likelihood that had the town needed to double its capital budget in order to build last mile so as to make that Middle Mile connection, project probably would not have happened. The availability of Middle Mile made the last mile project uh, viable. I'll give you a couple of other very powerful examples that um, I've witnessed recently. So there is a statewide Middle Mile network in Kentucky that's a public-private partnership known as Kentucky Wired. It's received a lot of uh, negative PR around a range of different reason, a, a range of different factors. Putting all that aside, because I think that's not actually the interesting part about Kentucky Wired. The interesting part is that there was an insight on this, the part of the um, the Commonwealth of Kentucky that it could build a middle mile network to connect its own anchor institutions, its own government facilities, including other public anchors like libraries and schools, if feasible. Um, and by making that network middle mile, potentially catalyze and stimulate new last mile deployment. All of that has happened over the past few years, but the really fascinating last mile projects that have materialized from that include several very small projects, what are locally known as microfiber projects. They're not actually microfiber, but they're micro size, fiber to the premises, and in some cases, wireless um, projects in Eastern Kentucky, in some of the most remote and rural parts of Eastern Kentucky, where there are largely unserved old coal company towns that have been effectively deserted by the companies that once sponsored them when the coal mines were open. But there is still population, there's still housing in these small towns. They range in size from 200 to 800 residents. And because of the availability of the middle mile capacity of the what has come out of the Kentucky Wired Initiative, a small local competitive um, uh, local exchange carrier known as uh, Eastern Telephone has partnered with these small towns to build fiber to the premises and wireless networks in these tiny little micro towns in in the mountains of coal country, old coal country, no longer really mining for coal of Eastern Kentucky. Without Kentucky Wired, none of these initiatives would have been feasible. Kentucky Wired is tens of millions of dollars of construction. These little fiber initiatives are hundreds of thousands, and in some cases, tens of thousands of dollars of construction. Had Eastern Telephone and these small towns needed to make the middle mile connection, these projects would never have materialized. And I would anticipate that in the coming decade, we are likely to see dozens and hopefully even hundreds of these very small locally based public private and public public partnerships in small towns in rural parts of Kentucky materialize for exactly this reason. One more really quick um, example that um, I think is um, also a really perfect illustration of how open middle mile has this important catalyzing impact is that in my home state of Maryland, we have also a statewide open access middle mile network. Uh, this was a collaboration between the state itself that built middle mile to connect government anchors, including most of the schools in the state, all of the county seats, the county buildings, all of the state public safety networks. And as the state was built, excuse me, the, the state public safety towers, as the state was building out this infrastructure for providing service to anchors, uh, to meet the needs of the public sector, it included, it built at the same time, a 96 count cable of fiber that was then given through um, an IRU to a, um, a, a nonprofit private entity, the Maryland Broadband Cooperative, which is our statewide broadband co-op, which is, uh, its membership includes many localities, public networks, private networks, all the big incumbents, et cetera. Um, and given the availability of that 96 count, which is um, required to be open access and available to all members of the cooperative um, and service is um, open middle mile service is available over that fiber, um, the, we have seen a substantial number of projects get started that wouldn't otherwise 
have um, been financially feasible. In our Appalachia region in the um, westernmost part of Maryland, uh, which is deep into the Allegheny Mountains, there are two providers who currently use that network. Um, one, a fixed wireless company in remote parts of um, our most mountainous county. Um, a, um, there, another one is a very small fixed wireless, uh, literally mom and pop operation that is financially viable because um, uh, services sold for five, seven, ten dollars per month over a network that generally uses Wi-Fi and rooftops um, could not possibly um, buy a costly commercial middle mile, let alone build middle mile capacity. And then on the, the other side of the state where we have um, uh, wetlands and um, the Chesapeake Bay um, and uh, the major Maryland uh, rivers, completely different geography than in the western part of the state. Um, we have public-private partnerships that have emerged in several counties. I'll give you one. Um, what I think is a terrific example is um, uh, Charles County, uh, Maryland, uh, which has substantial rural areas that are entirely unserved, has a collaboration with a local company building fiber to the premises. The company is named Think Big, and Think Big has committed to building fiber to the premises to all of the unserved locations throughout the county. Um, the middle mile gets Think Big into every one of the neighborhoods. Um, none of that um, initiative and none of that investment would have been feasible otherwise. So a few examples, I hope, that um, illustrate the model. And one last point maybe that they illustrate as well is that the payoff is not necessarily tomorrow or today. The payoff may be several years down the road because these are networks that take time to build. But the availability of the middle mile is a necessary prerequisite to that payoff, and um, it's uh, not too soon to start on that. Terrific, Joey, and uh, you you make some uh, so important points about the value of this resource because of the variability of circumstance. I mean, every community is unique, and you know when you add up all the different factors, and one size does not fit all which the carriers prefer, you know, that's what you want. You know, they want a standard model, you just force on everybody. And then where it doesn't work, you don't do anything. Uh, but, uh, but it's not like that at all. And it just makes the case that communities increasingly need to understand their circumstance and take responsibility for at least planning their infrastructure, if not building it, you know, well, however they want to do it. But just understand, it. you know, people now get how important it is but how to do it. And it's a much simpler uh, question if you have a resource like, like an open, affordable, uh, middle mile, uh, critical uh, uh, resource to, to build out. And, in, and increasingly the technology is getting closer to what we would call DIY, uh, especially these wireless networks. And what we've discovered, if I could just add on to this, it, it, you, you made the point about you know, smaller towns of, of a few hundred people. Well, when we look at these counties, these rural counties, they look really sparse, you know, very few people per square mile. But where people actually live is close together in these small towns, which make them well suited for you know, mesh wireless networks. And what we've seen is that these are much less expensive they don't, you know, it's, the performance is not the same as fiber to the home, but it's connectivity. And can connectivity can pull capacity because it enables people to, to operate at a certain level and demand more faster, better uh, broadband. Uh, uh, but increasingly these projects can be done by local communities, people serving themselves. And I think this is where the government the central government responsibility kind of meets with a local opportunity, you know, deliver middle mile and serve the anchor institutions. We already have that right as, as, as part of the universal service fund is we're, and as part of the national broadband plan is to deliver gigabit connectivity into every community. And we have, you know, mechanisms like E-rate to do that, which, 
is restricted from providing open uh, networks. But that leads me to a question uh, for you and, and for John and, uh, and Jordan about the, uh, uh, the, the business models for these. So I guess they're all types or it could be a private entity could do this. It could be a public entity. It could be a public private, public, public, any, or the, what, what are the best uh, models for these to happen that you, that you've seen so far? Anybody? Joanne. Joanne, you, you, you start and then I'll follow up from you. Um, great, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think open access middle mile is actually logical for a public entity. It's an area where public infrastructure owners can have enormous impact and catalyze private opportunity and private investment. And um, an open access middle mile is also something that is good from a public standpoint because the open access commitment is a critical piece of it. And it's very tempting for entities who are um, not only incented to be profit maximizing, but are obligated to be profit maximizing, right? So commercial entities is very tempting to um, back off of open access business models given the option because open access is not necessarily profit maximizing. And that's that's why I think many public entities step into that role. Um, and many do it also because they may have assets like this and they can utilize these assets accordingly. Um, but as with everything else, as you said, Don, it's very um, locally specific. So um, it may be a private entity, it may be a private for profit or nonprofit entity, it really depends on who has the assets, the will, and most importantly, I think the commitment to open access and, and stimulating that last mile investment and competition. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I said earlier, when introducing this topic, that this was a good opportunity for public private collaboration. And the reason is, and Joanne has said this, is that Middle Mile has a lot going for it as a public infrastructure, publicly funded infrastructure. First, it can connect governmental and important social institutions directly. And secondly, it serves, it creates what one might call positive externalities for private providers, right? It, 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 who can invest less and get to more homes. So a publicly funded open access Middle Mile offering opportunities for private entities to use the technologies of their choice to reach homes isn't the only way to proceed, but it's a, it is, in our view, a pretty robust model. Uh, that is great. I, I think you make an ideal point is that you could justify building these networks to serve the anchor institutions alone because Correct. most half of the population uses these facilities uh, and their critical functions. And then you have the opportunity for the added value to uh, reduce the cost for last mile deployments. It's, it's a and, and, yeah. Don, I mean to interrupt, but it does one other thing. We call our paper sort of, if we build it, will they come? So when we talk to public officials, they say, well, what if we build this network and nobody shows up? We think there are ways to encourage people to show up and we think there's a way to fund those places where it's most likely people show up. But your point is at the heart of this. If the economics are proven out by the supply of better connectivity to public institutions, then the downside risk of constructing an open access middle mile is considerably lower because we want people to come, but that's not been the sole purpose for, of construction. I think it's a great argument, and, and I, I know it's been made a number of times. So did you look back at, uh, at the prior, you know, uh, national bill for open middle mile under the stimulus program, the so-called uh, BTOP program, where I think there were like 125 of these projects funded? Did you, did you look at those? What happened to those? How many interconnect agreements, any of that? Do you have that information? In fact, some of the networks we talked about, and 
Drew, and you may want to talk about specific examples of this, had open access middle mile networks directly funded by those earlier efforts. And so we learned from them what had been accomplished. Jordan, do you want to speak to that? Sure. So um, several of the networks that um, we spoke to were either um, created or hugely expanded by VTOP funding. So um, there are uh, several examples, especially because of these state funding programs um, of middle mile networks that um, were created through other funding programs, but you certainly see the mark of that program um, in several different places. And one of the things that, one of the lessons for success I pointed out was ensuring that open access obligations continue. And so I think that might be, um, you know, something to think about for a future grant program. Now these, these BTOP funded programs um, are 10 years old. And as I said, in the case of Maine, they are being sold, the ownership is changing. Um, and so, you know, whatever future funding we have, it needs to ensure that whatever open, op open access obligations exist, they persist regardless of the ownership of the network. That's a great point and, and, a, and a super value for, for these networks uh, uh, living uh, longer and serving their purpose. So uh, what, uh, we're over just a few minutes here, but what, what would you say is the, the role for libraries in uh, making this case or championing these projects or what? What would you see uh, the value of libraries in this discussion? Joanne, you want to start, Jordan? Yeah. Go ahead. Anybody want to go before me? No? Um, I will I will just share briefly that I think um, libraries are an engaged and um, mission driven place where that can serve as a proof point of this model and um, catalyze locally. Obviously, e-rate complications make this a little bit more challenging, but um, we may see changes in that um, in coming months. Um, and um, we certainly should, as a matter of good policy, see changes in that. Um, and um, and the, this aligns, this, this vision, um, even at a modest level, modest scale, aligns so perfectly with the mission of libraries that it um, feels like a very uh, logical um, overlay. And I'm, and I'm hopeful that we will see, particularly with the wireless um, piece, um, proof points of the model um, built on local needs and local considerations and local partners in many, many places. Right, good. John. I'll just add one word, unless Jordan, I don't want to keep Jordan from talking, but look, over the last two years, we've been doing these reports and we've talked to librarians from around the country. What we've learned is that librarians are at the center of this issue for multiple reasons. They've learned about pre-COVID what broadband was being used for. We talked to librarians who talked about the numbers of people coming to the libraries with devices to use broadband. We've talked to librarians who learned how to transmit information, that's what libraries do, to people about the way to use broadband, including job training skills, not just how to operate a device or a software program, but how to use it to advance their, themselves in society. And of course, you sent us the photograph, Don, of the Pennsylvania Library in the early days of the pandemic that we put into one of our reports that had a sign out front saying, here's the password to the Wi-Fi. Because in an emergency, people coming to that parking lot could be critical in their efforts to continue having their kids stay online during school. And we've also seen the libraries are respected in their communities. As I've said before, I think the critical task is to explain to public officials that the greater demand for broadband is not a one-time thing. Society has changed and broadband has become even more important. And it seems to me librarians, both in talking about what their institutions need, the physical building, what their users need, and what communities need are, will be some of the most influential people in influen influential people in helping 
policymakers understand what needs to be done now. Beautifully said, Don. Uh, and your, your point about uh, duplicative networks, redundant networks, uh, while they may create a degree of resilience because more, you know, multiples better, uh, the efficiency is just really unacceptable because the costs are so high. We can't build multiple interstate highways, you know, uh, or even multiple state highways. So the, uh, to Joanne's point about E-rate, this program needs to be remodeled to fund these very projects. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just inexcusable. They're spending billions and billions of dollars a year on isolated networks. I mean, they are valuable and, and critical, but we're missing a huge bet. We just can't afford to miss it in the future. It, it ties into a question we're getting here about dig once. So these are policies, right? That, that enable and lower the cost of this. So, uh, you know, if you, if you lay a road, you put down conduit and you make that open, that's a segment of how these networks can be done. Uh, and, and also we have the question about slides. Uh, will you be able to post your slides somewhere? Of course. Okay. Uh, I guess you, do you happen to have that link now? You could put it in the, in the, in the chat. Um, Adrienne can tell us where on the Benton site she'd like to host it. Okay. I think she's in a better position. I, I tell you what, we will, we will post it, you know, when we do the recordings, uh, uh, on the, on the GLN site, we'll put that link there, uh, for the slides yes. to go with your Great. presentation. And of course you've just made the presentation, which is recorded and people can uh, go back and play it because, uh, you know, it's a lot more than just some slides. Of course. Um, I, I don't know, dig once is a, is a common policy. I'm, I'm just, these are chat questions. Uh, a common policy and intelligent policy that is being uh, implemented out there that, that libraries can help with. And, and let's just close with this point that libraries uh, are natural technology hubs in their communities. And one of, the, one of the roles we've seen them play is to convene this conversation, to at least host this conversation. So a community, We'll trust its library to be to have no agenda other than just helping everybody as many people as possible, and we've seen it uh, where librarians will ha host these conversations about these projects, and people will come in. All the different stakeholders come in, and 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 uh, and, and it doesn't require the librarian to be, you know, uh, an expert on any of this, rather than just being a facilitator of a conversation which will lead to these uh, various resources and ideas. So uh, this, is a, this is an important role for libraries ahead. We're gonna be facing a, an actual legislative opportunity, I think, in a matter of weeks. And so what you've done here with this report is extremely valuable and, and the country owes you a debt. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute if they would please unmute everyone and don before we do that can i can i ask a follow-up on my question so my nope. question really was um in the dig ones couldn't we also do people also put in the fiber and that can help the middle mile so that when they're digging up these streets in the areas why can't i mean i understand that it's on a state-by-state -state one now after looking at it and what efforts are being put in to push that extra fiber or dark fiber being put in? It, it depends on, you know, the awareness at the, at the, at the local level. The biggest cost you is the dig and the conduit. The fiber is relatively inexpensive compared to digging the actual trench and laying a conduit down. If you do that, you don't even really have to put the fiber in right away. You've accomplished a major portion of the cost of laying the, the, the system. So it's, it's a great policy and it should be adopted everywhere. So yeah. okay. everybody unmute, unmute please. We'd like to, we'd like to give our speakers a, a round of applause, please, if we could. We, we would do that if we were in person. So Yay. thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank Aloha. You. <laughs> and so we'll close the recording now. Thank you, Stephen. Close the recording.